The first item of business is portfolio questions. And as always, please try and be succinct. Um, the first question is Jenny Kilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress in delivery to the new so uh, Scottish Social Security System. Jean Freeman. Thank you. As Audit Scotland recognises, we are on track to deliver the first wave of devolved benefits. The 13% increase through the Carers Allowance Supplement will be delivered this year with Best Start Grant and Funeral Expense Assistance by summer 2019. We've started recruitment for the staff for our new agency, Social Security Scotland, both at the headquarters in Dundee and locally. But we cannot deliver the devolution of Social Security powers in isolation from the unavoidable central role of the DWP for the safe and secure transfer of the benefits. So it is imperative that the DWP match our pace for delivery and it's crucial that they have plans in place to prioritise this joint programme of work. Jenny Goldruth. I thank the Minister for that response. Does the Minister agree that the Scottish Government are currently fighting child poverty with one hand tied behind their back, particularly given that new research now confirms the number of children growing up in poverty in working households will be one million higher than in 2010 due to the UK Government's brutal benefits cuts? And can the Minister set out how the Scottish Government will make different choices with the limited powers it has? Jean Freeman. Thank you. I thank Ms Gilruth for that supplementary question. Um, I do agree with the point that she makes centrally in her supplementary. Already we are, as a Scottish Government, uh, providing over £125 million in this year to mitigate the worst effects of the UK Government's austerity welfare agenda. We are the only country in the UK to set targets for the reduction and eradication of child poverty. And with our new social security powers, which embed in legislation, which all of this parliament voted for, that social security is a human right, that best start grant that we will introduce to replace the sure start grant is a significant financial investment in young families together with the increase in carers. We are talking about a partnership between this government and the citizens that we represent. But let me repeat, for us to deliver what we have promised, it requires the DWP to match our pace. And already we have at least two instances where they are falling behind the agreements that we have reached with them and are delaying our progress. Uh, supplementary, Michelle Ballantyne. Thank you. Um, I agree with the Minister that the success of this social security system will rely on a close working relationship between the Scottish Government and the DWP. So can the Minister tell me what steps have been taken to ensure that interactions between the DWP and the Scottish Social Security Agency, particularly in areas of split competence, are as smooth as possible? Jean Freeman. Well, as um, we've said before in this chamber and at Social Security Committee, um, our officials, our Social Security officials in government and DWP officials are in constant, uh, arguably daily contact in order to ensure that we progress uh, this work. However, what does happen from time to time, and we've got a couple of examples of this recently, which the Social Security Committee knows, is the four-month delay in receiving the integration software code from the DWP. That was four months after the date that we had agreed with them, and they'd agreed with us. A delay of a year in implementing our uh, commitment to mitigate the bedroom tax, a delay of a year over the date that we had agreed with the DWP. So actually, the officials on both sides are doing their very best. Um, however, I need the Secretary of State for the Department of Work and Pensions to give me an assurance that the warm words of this cooperative joint work will be met by her ensuring that her department prioritises the work with us in light of anything else that they may be doing. That's not been the case most recently and we will continue to pursue that with her. Supplementary, Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. My constituent, Kate Dury, was diagnosed with motor neurone disease last year at the age of 67. As PIP does not apply to those over 65, Kate is not eligible uh, for PIP, meaning she cannot access mo a mobility allowance nor automatically qualify for a power chair. She's had to spend £1,700 of her own money and is likely to have to buy another chair in addition to this. So disabled Scots are looking for certainty about how this assistance will give them access to equipment that they need for their lives. And in the absence of any detailed Can disability you come assistance to your question, please? proposal, a clear time to one minister say today whether disability assistance will cover all adults or whether she will open up mo the mobility component to older disabled people. 
Jean Freeman. So, as I'm sure Mr Johnson is well aware, we've been talking about it for two years, the way that we go about designing the delivery and the content of the benefits that we are responsible for is through that direct engagement through our experience panels and with our stakeholder groups. And they help us to uh, devise what the system should be. Uh, and they also help us to devise not only what the system should be, but how it should be delivered. So we will continue to discuss with them uh, matters can, uh, respective to attendance allowance and the disability assistance, including, because it has been raised with me before, the possibility of offering a choice with an attendance allowance, for example, for a mobility component. But we need to work all that through and we are doing it with them. And as soon as we have a resolution to that, I will, of course, make the Chamber aware. Question number two, David Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how much it is investing in delivering more affordable homes across Fife in 2018-19. Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Scottish Government has allocated affordable housing supply programme funding of over £30 million to Fife in this financial year. This will be for Housing Association and Fife Council projects to deliver a range of housing in a mix of affordable tenures, but primarily focusing on social rented housing, which is a key government priority as we aim to deliver 35,000 social rent homes across Scotland as part of our 50,000 affordable homes programme. David Torrance. I thank the Minister for that answer. Would the Minister commit to publishing a breakdown of this funding across all of Scotland's local affordable areas? And could he set out how a level of funding for affordable homes across Scotland compares to other parts of the UK? Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Yes, the uh, Scottish Government's spend per head on the affordable housing programme is three times higher than that of the UK Government uh, and their spending on their affordable homes programme. Uh, a full breakdown of the £568 million allocated to all of Scotland's local authority areas for 2018-19 is published on the Scottish Government's website uh, and I'd be happy to make that available to the member. Supplementary from Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. During 2016-17, only 7,336 affordable homes were completed. And if this target continues, there will only be around 36,000 homes completed by March 2021. And the SNP's target of 50,000 homes will not be achieved until two years later. Delivering sufficient supply of affordable Can you housing come to the should question, be a matter please? of urgency. Can I ask what the Scottish Government are doing to ensure that it is a matter of urgency? Kevin Stewart. Uh, President officer, as I explained at committee this morning, um, the target itself uh, uh, is not 10,000 a year. It is 50,000 over the course uh, of this parliament. Uh, and we know that uh, many housing associations and councils, uh, now that they have uh, the resource planning assumptions for the next three years of 1.79 billion pounds, are putting plans in place to ensure the delivery. Um, uh, the target that we have is extremely ambitious, presiding officer, uh, but a recent report by Shelter, uh, the Chartered in Institute of Housing, and the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, agrees that we are on track to deliver 50,000 affordable homes during the course of this term. Um, Question number three, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Equalities and Human Rights Commission regarding whether the recent and proposed bank closures contravene the Equalities Act of 2010. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, I believe that the proposed bank closures and their replacement with mobile banking services will have a serious implications for disabled people. Uh, that's why I have written to the Scotland Commissioner at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, asking her to consider these implications in light of the requirements placed on organisations uh, by the provisions of the Equality Act 2010 to ensure that a disabled person can access the same services and premises as far as possible as someone who is not disabled. And I'm happy to share that letter with the member. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The mobile banks that have been introduced in my own constituency of Edinburgh Pentlands do not provide disability access. And I'm just wondering, does the Minister share my concern that the 30-minute stopping timeframe 
is inadequate to meet the demand of individuals and the areas that they serve. Angela Constance. Sign off, sir. I do very much uh, share the, the, the member's concerns, and I know that uh, the concerns that he's articulated today are shared by many members uh, across uh, the chamber. Uh, it is, in my view, unacceptable that disabled people uh, could, in effect, be excluded from conducting their financial affairs in bank premises or facilities because the, the physical barriers uh, presented by the mobile banking fleet uh, may make it impossible uh, for those services to be used. Uh, and that's exactly uh, why I've raised uh, this issue with the EHRC. Uh, the Equality Act places uh, a requirement on organisations to take positive steps to ensure that a disabled person can access the same services and premises as far as possible as someone who is not disabled. And if the proposed uh, mobile banking alternative uh, does not meet this standard, then the potential implications of that uh, would indeed be considerable. And so far as the time constraints are concerned, this is something which uh, I would urge uh, the bank to reconsider. Uh, people should have sufficient time to <coughs> conduct their transactions without having to worry about a time limit. Supplementary, Monica Lennon. Thank you. Proposals by Link, the UK's largest cash machine network, have raised fears that many ATMs could disappear from the high street. And Age Scotland warned this will hit older people hard. Does the Minister agree that banks should be investing more in the ATM network? And does she welcome the bill proposed by Jed Killen, MP, which seeks to ban ATM charges and protect access to free cash withdrawals? Angela Constance. So, you know, so I think the member raises uh, a very uh, considered point. Um, there are a, a range of financial and banking services that are important to us all, uh, and the, the ATM network does indeed um, you know, improve access for everybody, but in particular uh, you know, for people who may have uh, disability issues or, or other uh, issues in life uh, to uh, contend with. Uh, so having an, an ATM uh, service and facility uh, that's available as possible is, of course, uh, very uh, uh, worthwhile. Uh, and, of course, I would echo the concerns by Age Concern and others uh, about uh, challenges charging uh, in ATM uh, services and if there are uh, aspects uh, of uh, the matters that the members raised that she would like us to pick up as ministers, uh, we could certainly do that because I have already outlined the action uh, that in this portfolio we've taken, but uh, ministers in other portfolio uh, are indeed um, engaging uh, with the bank uh, as, as a business and how that could be more inclusive. Uh, time is moving on and we're not getting on terribly far through the questions. Could I ask both questioners and those who answer to bear that in mind? And question number four is Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will be, provide an update on the take-up among claimants of the Scottish Universal Credit Fle Flexibilities. Jean Freeman. <clears throat> the latest data which we published on the 24th of January shows that between the 11th of November and the 31st of December last year, 5,800 people had been offered one or both of the Scottish choices. Around 2,500 people have taken up either one or both of those. Subject to the provision of data by the Department of Work and Pensions, we plan to publish management information covering the first six months of the operation of Scottish choices in the summer this year. Claire Adamson. Uh, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, a recent Channel 4 investigation found that some 70% of DW staff say the rollout of universal credit should be stopped. This also follows a Trussell Trust figure showing food bank use is up 52% in areas that have had full universal credit rollout for 12 months or more. Does the Minister agree with me that the overwhelming evidence points to the rollout of universal credit having nothing short of a disaster? And will she join me once again in calling for the UK Government to halt its rollout and, if not, devolve it fully to this Parliament when we can make different choices in the best interest of the people of Scotland? Jean Freeman. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Layer upon layer of evidence over the past two years um, demonstrate repeatedly that universal credit, both in terms of the policies within it and the freezing of those benefits and the systems itself, is 
uh, not fit for purpose and is causing significant hardship to many individuals across the country, but also to uh, organisations and to local authorities themselves. And most recently, we have learned from the Chartered Institute of Housing, the Institute uh, Revenues Rating and Valuation and the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations of the particular difficulties they have with the way uh, the DWP schedules the payments of rent. So, the evidence is overwhelming, but the UK government continues to pursue uh, a policy and a delivery mechanism which uh, all evidence shows is failing. So, contrary to the myths perpetrated, and most recently in the Alawa Advertiser by a Conservative MP, this government is not shying away from uh, the benefit responsibilities we have. On the contrary, simply give us more powers and the resources to match them, and I will happily show the UK government how much better we can do on the grain going with the grain of people of Scotland with a system that is based on human rights. Now, I, I recognise that ministers like to give fulsome answers on all the information they can, but could I ask you to bear in mind that there are many people who wish to ask questions. And question number five is Jamie Halcrow johnson uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Moat and rural areas. Th that was a really good short question. You caught me unawares there. Jean Freeman. <laughs> Thank you, President Officer. We provide support to older people in those communities through our investment across a number of areas, including improving digital engagement, accessible housing, ha transport, specifically the bus pass and the air dis discount scheme, and the road equivalent tariff fares and the Clyde and Hebrides routes reforming adult and social care, a free personal nursing care, which helps about 78,000 people. In addition, our new social security powers include responsibility for benefits that will be particularly helpful uh, to older people, and our current groundbreaking draft strategy on social isolation and loneliness is taking positive steps to consult with older people, particularly in rural communities, on what we might next do. Jamie Halcrow johnson uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, older people regularly find themselves in the target of scams, mis-selling, and pressurised door-to-door sales, and evidence from Age UK suggests that almost a half of older people have been targeted in this way. Cracking down on scams has been raised by Older People's Assembly, who visited Parliament this month, and Trading Standards has agreed to look into the views of older people themselves. So can I ask the Minister, uh, the minister what actions uh, she will take or is taking to protect older people from these uh, targeted actions by unscrupulous individuals and businesses? Jean Freeman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I thank the member for that supplementary question. There are some of uh, the areas that he has raised that relate to the new consumer powers uh, that we have, and we, I will raise that with the Cabinet Secretary concerned. But in ad addition, I know that my colleague, Mr Matheson, the Justice Secretary, is keenly aware of this matter and is discussing that with uh, our police service and others. Question number six, Edwin Mountain. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when the Cabinet Secretary last met with officials from the Highland Council. Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, Scottish Government ministers and officials regularly meet with Council officers uh, across Scotland, including the Highland Council. Edward Thank you for that answer. In the last 20 years, there's been a 55% increase in the number of people aged 75 and over living in the Highlands, with a corresponding reduction in the number of younger people. Given Audit Scotland's report on local government in Scotland, the Highland Council has accepted a need for a fundamental redesign of service provision. What specific financial actions will the Scottish Government commit to in providing help to the Highland Council in the huge redesign of provision of local services? Angela Constance. So, you know, so I think it's a, a really interesting question uh, that Mr uh, Mountain uh, raises. Uh, the issue of uh, an ageing population and depopulation uh, in the Highland area and other parts of Scotland is a very real concern, uh, both for the provision uh, of public services and for parts of the economy, but also, uh, I think, broader than that in terms of you know, strong, cohesive, uh, resilient uh, communities. And the question that he asks does touch upon uh, many areas uh, of government. In terms of my own portfolio, I suppose I would highlight uh, our investment in housing. The Highland Council uh, currently benefits for £40 million uh, in capital for affordable housing. That will increase to £45 million by the end of this uh, Parliament. But there's also uh, the work that we are doing in and around the review of uh, local governance. This isn't just about local government services, it's about the public uh, service as a whole. 
uh, and also uh, a strong theme uh, or thread running through all of that work is about how we empower uh, communities and enable citizens to have more say in the decisions that are taken at a local level. <coughs> Supplementary from Kate Forbes. Thank you. Uh, specifically on housing, further to Edward Mountain's question, can the Cabinet Secretary outline how the partnership between the SNP Government and Highland Council through the Highland Infrastructure Fund is helping to deliver affordable housing across the region? Angela Constance. Uh, President officer, Scottish Government uh, housing officials uh, meet with the Highland Council on actually a weekly basis uh, through the, the Highland Housing Hub. Uh, this is a very strong uh, partnership arrangement which helps deliver uh, affordable homes in the area. Uh, and the Highland Council uh, leads on the, the overall management uh, of the Highland Infrastructure Loan Fund. Uh, all developers can bid for the fund uh, through the Council. £6 million uh, has already been invested uh, with a further uh, £4 million currently available uh, for further uh, developments and I'm aware that there are two uh, significant projects uh, one in Drumland Rocket and the other in Inverness and this will enable 680 new affordable homes uh, to be delivered in these locations uh, alongside private housing developments. <coughs> Question number seven, Miles Briggs. Thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that the planning system supports the development of infrastructure in areas with a growing population. Kevin Stewart. President officer, planning authorities are required to prepare development plans to guide future development and infrastructure. An infrastructure first approach uh, to development is an important part of our ongoing planning reforms. Miles Briggs. I thank the Minister for that answer. Constituents in Edinburgh who live in communities where we're seeing a large increase in the number of new houses and flats being built are becoming increasingly concerned at the huge pressure growing populations are placing on vital local health services, with many surgeries being restricting their patient lists. What future public service scoping plans are being undertaken to make sure we meet the future needs of new and existing communities? Kevin Stewart. Um, President officer, um, as, I, as I pointed out, we are uh, looking at all of this through the planning uh, bill. But the Scottish Government has uh, provided and supported investment in three health, health centres in, in Lothian uh, in recent times. The Blackburn Partnership Centre, the Fair Hill Partnership Centre and North... North uh, West Edinburgh Partnership Centre, um, which have all recently become operational. Uh, and we've also opened uh, phase one of the new Royal Edinburgh Hospital last year. Uh, now, I want to ensure that local development plans, local authorities uh, and the health service uh, talk to one another to make sure that their plans are absolutely and truly and utterly intertwined. It's one of the reasons why I've spoken so often about uh, intertwining community planning uh, with spatial planning, because I think that uh, will lead to essential changes. Um, and I hope that uh, that answers Mr Briggs' question, presiding officer, as I see you're telling me to move on. It wasn't actually you I was motioning at, but please don't get up again. <laughs> 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 Supplementary from Ivan McKee. Thank you, Sign Officer. Um, a good example of this is Rob Royston in my constituency, where a further 1,600 new homes are being proposed on top of several other, other completed developments, where the local community is rightly concerned about the lack of clarity on provision of local facilities in an area that already suffers from a lack of such provision. How does planning legislation ensure that adequate facilities such as schools, health centres and other local amenities are provided to cover the increased population of areas such as this? Kevin Stewart. Um, President officer, uh, our approach to de developing the planning bill has involved extensive engagement, uh, including with children and young people, because I think it's important that we involve them uh, uh, because they are the future. Uh, and for example, we undertook a survey with Young Scott uh, which showed that young people want to be more involved in planning. Um, while I cannot uh, comment on specific planning applications, as uh, Mr uh, McKee well understands, I, I agree that new housing developments uh, should be uh, uh, supported by the facilities uh, that meet local needs. Uh, and to help achieve this, uh, the planning bill will introduce stronger development plans which are prepared with local communities linked to community planning and supported by clearer de delivery programmes. I think that's good for all. Question number eight, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To uh, ask the Scottish Government how it dis encourages non-departmental public bodies to promote and facilitate public participation in their decisions and activities. Kevin Stewart. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, in 2016, we refreshed the national standards for community engagement, uh, and these play a crucial role in helping all sectors, including non-departmental public bodies, to promote and facilitate public participation in their decisions and activities. Uh, in addition, the Community Empowerment Act provides a new right for community bodies to make participation requests to certain bodies, including a no number of non-departmental public bodies. And this provides opportunities for community bodies to proactively be involved in improving outcomes on their terms. Tavish Scott. Thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that answer? He will be aware that officers who have that responsibility for public participation and who work in the islands and who have to travel to the Scottish mainland for work will soon have to pay the car parking charges at island airports. Which government budget will pay that cost? Kevin Stewart. I, I missed the last part of um, Mr Scott's question there. I, I beg uh, your pardon, President Officer. Um, uh, uh, that doesn't surprise me, actually, presiding officer, that he was asking me to pay something, uh, pay for something. Uh, in terms of uh, the serious matter of uh, parking charges at uh, uh, the island airports, I know that Highlands and Islands Airport Limited um, is consulting extensively about the implementation of the extension of car parking charges uh, to Kirkwall, Stornoway, and Sumbra airports, uh, and this includes passenger surveys at each airport, uh, as well as discussions with local authorities and elected representatives. And I hope uh, that those discussions uh, will continue, uh, and that we will see positivity from those discussions. A very short supplementary from Donald Cameron. Thank you. It's likewise on the subject of, of Hyle, will the minister commit to proper, meaningful, and urgent consultation with people on Lewis? who will be severely affected by proposed, um, the proposed imposition of car parking charges at Stornoway Airport. As I've said, Highlands and Islands Airport are consulting uh, with people in Kirkwall, Stornoway and uh, at Sumbra Airport. Uh, and I hope uh, that that comes uh, to some positivity, as I've said. Obviously, uh, President of Officer, this is not my portfolio, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Mr Yousaf uh, will uh, be in touch with all of the members in this regard. Question number nine, Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer uh, members to my register of interest to ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting medically trained and qualified refugees in Scotland to achieve medical registration and contribute their skills to NHS Scotland. Angela Constance. President Officer, the Scottish Government is providing funding to the Refugee Doctors Project, which is run by a partnership led by the, the Bridges uh, programmes. It aims to support refugees who were fully qualified doctors in their home countries uh, to achieve general medical council registration and a licence to practice medicine. The new funding provided uh, for this year means the project has been expanded to include dentists for the first time. I am delighted to say that 37 doctors have already benefited uh, from the project since funding was first provided in April 2017. Claire Hockey. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary take this moment to acknowledge a recent analysis showing that Scotland has stood by its claim to be a sanctuary for those fleeing conflict, and in particular the city of Glasgow, having the highest intake of Syrian refugees and asylum seekers relative to its population? Angela Constance. Signing officer, uh, recent analysis by the, the BBC looked at home office statistics for refugees and asylum seekers uh, alongside uh, population statistics. And I am pleased to uh, quote the article which stated that it appears uh, that Scotland has generally embraced its claim to be a sanctuary for those fleeing conflict. Uh, Glasgow has taken 63 refugees and asylum seekers per 10,000 uh, in the city, uh, and that's the highest level uh, for any uh, local authority. Authority. And I want to pay tribute to Glasgow because of their knowledge and expertise in supporting refugees and asylum seekers. It has been absolutely uh, vital to the, the collaborative work uh, of our new Scots refugee integration strategy. And that shared vision uh, and partnership approach to new Scots uh, has supported local authorities the length and breadth of Scotland, who since 2015 uh, have welcomed around 2,200 refugees uh, through the Syrian resettlement programme. Question number 10, Daniel Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what planning requirements there are for public input prior to the sale of large public buildings and public land. 
Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. There are no town and country planning requirements related to the sale of land or buildings, whether public or private, because planning is concerned with the physical changes to land and buildings or material changes in their use, uh, but not the sale of land or buildings or who owns them. Daniel Johnson. Well, I thank the Minister for that answer. When public buildings are sold to private developers, they're not just the public sector who are losing an asset, but the entire community. In my constituency, discussions are underway with NHS Lothian about the disposal of the Ashley Ainsley Hospital and its surrounding site. For many, it's not just a hospital, but a green space, walking routes and part of the local community. So does the Minister agree with me that large public shelves should go through the highest possible levels of pre-sale planning processes to allow real public scrutiny and consultation? And will he consider what could be done in the forthcoming planning bill to require public bodies to secure such detailed planning requirements prior to sale? Because after all, publicly owned buildings belong no. to all of us and we should have a say You've in how they're used in the future. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Kevin Stewart. As I pointed out in my um, first answer, Presiding officer, planning is concerned with the physical changes to land and buildings or material changes in their use, uh, but not the sale of land or buildings or who owns them. Um, I understand that as part of the process of disposing surplus assets, NHS Lothian is committing to engagement with all key stakeholders. Uh, these include the general public, MSPs, councillors, uh, the City of Edinburgh Council Planning Department, Historic Environment Scotland and other interest groups to collate ideas and issues which are of importance to people of that community. Question 11, Liam Kerr. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether there has been a recent assessment of Scotland's future housing needs. Kevin Stewart. Uh, President Officer, local authorities, as the statutory local housing and planning authority, undertake regular and continual need and demand assessments to support the development of their local housing strategies and development plans. These plans are assessed by the Scottish Government to ensure that they are both robust and credible. In 2015, Sheffield Hallam undertook an assessment of affordable housing need across Scotland, commissioned by the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, the Chartered Institute for Housing and Shelter, to which Scottish Government analytical staff contributed. Liam Kerr. Thank the Minister for that answer, and I remind the Chamber of my register of interest. Specifically, I'm a landlord of a small flat in Edinburgh. Minister, under the SNP, the number of long-term empty properties has increased from 20,328 in 2007 to 37,135 in 2017, a rise of 83% to its highest ever recorded level. So what action is the government taking to tackle this rise in empty properties, solve the housing crisis, and enable more people to realise their dream of having a home? Kevin Stewart. Uh, President officer, I thank Mr Kerr for his questions uh, in that regard. We uh, are cooperating uh, with Shelter, uh, have doubled the Empty Homes Fund uh, to bring uh, homes back into use. Uh, we have encouraged all local, local authorities through that partnership with Shelter uh, to put in place their own Empty Homes officers uh, and those local authorities that have done so uh, have seen a, a number of properties come back into use uh, in the places where they exist. So we have doubled the budget for empty homes. Uh, we cooperate with Shelter and I would encourage all local authorities who have not yet in place uh, put empty homes officers in place to do so because that makes a real difference. A quick supplementary from Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Given that recent research by Crisis has demonstrated the huge cost to councils of keeping people in temporary accommodation beyond seven days, what does the Minister think are the current barriers to councils getting people out of unsuitable temporary accommodation and what can be done to reduce those barriers? Kevin Stewart. Like uh, Ms Smith, who's taken a keen interest on this issue for a, a long time, uh, I want to see uh, no one uh, in unsuitable accommodation. And that's why uh, the government has uh, put so much effort into uh, the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping Action Group, uh, who are due to report uh, on the third question that they've been set is, how do we improve temporary accommodation in Scotland? Uh, their recommendations uh, will be with us very shortly. Uh, I'm very interested in seeing them uh, and we will respond uh, accordingly. Uh, Ms Smith will be aware that thus far uh, we have accepted all of the rec recommendations in principle uh, that HARSAG have put to us uh, and I look forward to receiving their next set of recommendations. Question number 12, Claire Baker. To ask the Scottish Government on what date the first payments of the carers' allowance supplement will be made. 
Jean Freeman. Excuse me, Miss. Oh, you have your year I'm back. <laughs> so, uh, a 13 per cent increase, which will be upgraded in line with inflation in future years, constitutes an overall investment of more than 30 million a year and benefits over 70,000 carers. The first payments will be made this summer. Claire Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for that response, but earlier this year the Social Security Committee heard a decision on the status of Carers 11 supplement for the purposes of calculating council tax reduction was still to be taken as civil servants had not yet completed their analysis. I think people are concerned about the date at which this will be introduced. And can I ask the Minister, given that there are 8,700 carers in Mid Scotland and Fife, can she confirm whether the Government will ensure that the additional income will be disregarded if carers get or receive the, or apply for the council tax reduction. Jean Freeman. I thank Ms Baker for that supplementary. Uh, as she said, work is underway with our uh, officials working on council tax reduction and in social security. And I'd be happy to update her as soon as we have completed that work and are clear that the council tax reduction and the carers allowance supplement will not contradict each other, if I can put it like that. Question number 13, John Finney. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it ensures that public bodies respect the rights of gypsy travellers. Angela Constance. President Officer, Scottish Ministers expect public bodies to respect the rights of uh, all the communities they serve and to be responsive to their needs in providing high quality public services. Public bodies also have legal duties to eliminate discrimination, promote equality and foster good relations. And this includes gypsy travellers who are protected as an ethnic group in Scotland. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer. I, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and she'll be familiar with the, the, the definition, which includes the, the, the um, phrase that, that uh, people who consider the travelling lifestyle part of their ethnic identity. I've read the Ministerial Working Group's um, extensive list of matters they're going to cover. I accept that it doesn't Could say it's an exhaustive Could you get to the question, list. please, yes. Mr. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, will you engage with the Gypsy Traveller community, establish traditional stopping over places that were all, many of them which were sealed up, um, encourage landowners, including local authorities and other public bodies, to open these sites up again to reinforce the value we place on this travelling lifestyle, please. Angela Constance. President officer, uh, the Scottish Government does indeed uh, recognise the rights of the gypsy traveller community to a travelling uh, lifestyle uh, that is part of their way of life, uh, their tradition and uh, their history. Um, the issue about halting stops uh, in traditional routes is one that we are pursuing, uh, that I'm pursuing together with the, the, the housing minister. Uh, there are a whole host of other issues in and around sites uh, and access to other services which uh, need to be resolved to support uh, the right of the travelling community to uh, their travelling heritage. Question number 14, Graham Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government how it monitors the performance of property factors. Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 uh, provides for the performance of factors to be regulated by requiring anyone acting as a factor to be registered and to comply with a code of conduct which sets out minimum standards of practice. This process provides a route of appeal to the Housing and Property Chamber, which among other things enables owners to have their concerns about their factor adjudicated by an independent judicial body. The tribunal notifies Scottish ministers of its decisions and when a property factor has been found to have failed to comply with any enforce enforcement order imposed by the tribunal. Graham Simpson. Thank you. Um, since 2013, the tribunal has issued 169 um, order, enforcement orders against factoring companies. One in five of those orders have never been complied with, um, which I think is pretty disgraceful. Um, what is the minister doing about that? And can he tell us, has he struck off any, any factoring companies, particularly repeat offenders? Kevin Stewart. Design officer, uh, two property factors have been removed from the register due to failing to comply with the code and property factor enforcement orders. Uh, five property factors have been removed for technical reasons. Uh, 78 prop property factors have been automatically removed from the register as they did not reapply to the expiry of their three-year registration period. Um, I know that Mr Simpson has uh, taken an interest of this. I met him uh, during the course of the recess uh, on this issue. 
Um, I have a determination uh, to ensure that those folks um, who uh, are not applying uh, the code uh, properly uh, are dealt with. Um, and Mr Simpson, I know, uh, will uh, be requiring a uh, regular update from me in a particular point that he has raised, and he can be assured uh, that I will keep in touch with him around about that issue, um, because I want to see uh, this uh, done right for those folks that have had to throw uh, property factors who may not be doing uh, the job as they should. That concludes question time. And if folk could rearrange themselves, we'll move on to the next item of business.